Hi, Robin. Hey, Anne. <laughs> well, I'm Anne Althouse, and uh, you're, I'm old to blogging heads. Uh, they're tired of me, so they're interested in you, and I'm really pleased to get a chance to introduce you to the blogging heads audience. You're Robin Gavon. Of the Washington Post. Of the the Washington Post. It's great to be here. I've never done this before, so... Have you watched any of our little dialogues? I I, I have, but, you know, the whole technology thing is, you know, I'm just up to iPods. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but it'll work. They'll put it all together. We don't need to worry about the technical stuff. We just need to talk about fashion and, and breasts and, and, and all of those wonderful not things. Not breasts, <laughs> necklines, cleavage. <laughs> this is so, not Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> wait, wait, I couldn't hear you. Say that again. I said it's not Grey's Anatomy. I mean the book, <laughs> not the television show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Camille Paglia has a new column out. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but the, she starts off with a question about your uh, famous Hillary Clinton uh, oh dear. column. She frames the question this way. I thought it was uh, kind of sharp. Uh, why was Clinton campaign advisor Ann Lewis, sister mm-hmm. of Barney Frank, so addled and strangely superheated by the Washington Post's whimsical meditation on the saggy Hillary cleavage <laughs> that she instantly turned it into a crass cash come on? Well, I have to say, other than the sagging part of that... Yeah, that was uncalled for. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm all over that. Rock on, uh-huh. Camille. <laughs> so, uh, so tell us about the column and how it, uh, how it came to be. So, I don't know if... I, yeah. I feel like everybody must know about it, but you should fill us in on what happened. Well, you know, I was um, in my office in New York, and actually a colleague of mine from the National Desk had sent me a message saying... Are you watching C-SPAN too? Uh, uh-huh. You know, Senator Clinton is on, and she's showing cleavage. <laughs> and since I don't have C-SPAN two on a continuous loop in my office, I actually you know went to the tape, and mm-hmm. you know the people who have said that they didn't notice it. I mean, I don't know what they were looking at because I took one glance and it was really obvious to me. And well, maybe these are people who claim that they actually never look at women's breasts, that they have it so ingrained in their conscious mind that they believe they're not looking. That their eyes can't <laughs> tilt down they just can't slightly look down. and go there. <laughs> but, you know, I saw it, and I thought it was really interesting because I've been, you know, obviously writing about her off and mm-hmm. on since her days as First Lady, and she's had a really sort of public, interesting, somewhat tortured relationship with fashion, and the fact that she was on the Senate floor, which is this incredibly reserved environment, the two things came together for me, and I thought it was just sort of an interesting observation that she was, that this is what she was doing. I didn't mm-hmm. think that it was at all unseemly, uh-huh. nothing to be embarrassed about, and I feel like I'm, you know, now sort of quoting from Ann Lewis, from, you know, some of the emails, but... You know, I didn't think that it was anything that was necessarily inappropriate. I just thought that it was an interesting moment, considering where it was and who it was. And then, you know, the rest is like... <laughs> do, you think people, do you think people just see that you're talking about a woman's breasts, and mm-hmm. since you couldn't go up to a woman and say, hmm, I see uh, cleavage, you wouldn't right. say that to her in person. Do you think that people think, well, how could you possibly write about it, and then just the mere act of writing about it kind of flipped people out into, and they just couldn't read what you were saying? I think there were some people for whom the mere mention of it was problematic, Uh that it just should never be mentioned as far as they are concerned. But, you know, I do think that that on, there were some people who I think had an incredible, a real knee-jerk reaction, and sort of a politically correct Mm knee-jerk reaction, Mm -hmm. which is that any time a woman of some authority is discussed in terms of her appearance. It can only be bad. And we must be on guard against this at all costs because every time a woman's appearance is mentioned publicly, a a, a point is subtracted from her IQ. I mean, that seemed to be a big part of what was going on. Uh I also thought some people didn't really read the column. I thought some people brought, you know, their own baggage to it. Uh, and and and, yeah. and that influenced the way that they that they took it, and I also think that it it was the idea of sort of looking at a woman as a full person, 
mm -hmm. including her sexuality, I think, turn, makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Well, but, no, now, uh, go ahead. Well, uh, Ruth Marcus, who's at the Washington Post, too, wrote a, a piece mm -hmm. about your piece in which she seemed to think that Hillary was just making a mistake, to just didn't know, that she actually couldn't, uh, wouldn't want anyone to think of her as a sexual being when she's giving a speech on the Senate floor. And so, therefore, it must have just been a blunder. It couldn't have been uh, calculated. Well, I think that that's... Uh I and you do compare it to a man with an open fly at one point in a yeah, part of the piece that I think people didn't understand. Well, I mean, I compared it to in, in that way because it was a very subtle display of cleavage. And mm -hmm. I thought that often, you know, your the way that you respond to it is you do have that sense of, am I supposed to be seeing that? Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't the case of someone putting it out there um, in a really obvious way like, um, you know, Jackie Smith did in the UK, and I brought her into the discussion. Yeah. But, um, yeah. you know, with, with Senator Clinton, it was a lot more subtle. And I think one of the reactions, certainly, that I had to it was, on the one hand, I thought it was actually quite wonderful that mm -hmm. here she was showing a little... A, a sort of acknowledging her femininity, acknowledging her sexuality, while also, you know, talking about higher education. I mean, that's like a full person there talking, not someone who feels like they have to kind of hide behind uh, a uniform. So now, was part of the problem that she wasn't that that she did it in a kind of a teasing way, where you're not you're not sure if she meant to show it or not, and that that was a problem. I mean, and that, that it would have been better if she'd actually uh, been open about it, like Jackie. Uh, What's her name? Jackie Smith in the I think, UK? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, you know, I'm not certainly advocating that, you know, anyone come onto the Senate floor look, look, looking like they should be waiting tables at Hooters or something. But yeah. <laughs> I do think that it was it was subtle, and since it was Senator Clinton who, you know, who has uh, sort of publicly always dressed in a much more sort of buttoned-up way, that you, you were sort of left wondering... You know, it's a bit teasing. Is it on purpose? Like, what's going on there? I felt like it wasn't something that was so blatant that you did have this feeling of, am I supposed to notice that? Am I supposed <laughs> yeah. to be looking at that? Like, you know, there was a level of, of yeah. discomfort. Well, I mean, don't you think that, uh, I mean, she must have people working on her image and getting her her clothes. I mean, it must be just, uh, I mean, that question that you have must just be the deniability that's intentionally built into and that the whole thing is intentional. Mm -hmm. I mean, how could she possibly be so in, and don't, how could she of all people be that inept since she's notably calculated? And then just yeah. uh, beyond that, don't women, don't women know where their breasts are unless they're really incompetent? <laughs> I mean, I think I think most women know where their breasts are. I mean, one of the one of the questions that I actually pose to someone is, you know, when you're talking, when you start talking about cleavage, a lot of things I think come into play in terms of how you react to it. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, if a young woman came to you, someone in her early twenties, and she said, "Hey, this is what I'm wearing for my big job interview tomorrow. What do you think?" Mm -hmm. And if the blouse was cut the same way that the senator's was, and you saw that little hint of right. cleavage. I think that a lot of people might suggest to that young woman, maybe you want to wear something that's not quite so low cut. But I don't yeah. know that you would respond the same way if it was someone coming to you who was 50 years old and had a really substantial resume, a resume that said more than, hi, I just graduated from college. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I mean, do you think that it was related to the fact that Elizabeth Edwards had just said, I think it was about the day before, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, had said that her husband was kind of a, well, as it was quoted in Drudge, and it wasn't really a direct quote, but I, I, Drudge yeah. had a quote that was something like, gender bender, wife Edwards says Hillary behaving like a man. And that was in quotes. It wasn't really the quote of Elizabeth Edwards, but she yeah. said something that sort of could be translated or paraphrased that way. And so it seems like uh, it was like, you know how you're supposed to, when you're criticized in, in politics, you should come mm -hmm. back immediately and answer mm -hmm. it immediately. And it seemed like uh, a lot of people, I mean, I did a post about your column, and a lot of people in the comments thought that those two things were related, that this was, you know, this was her immediate answer. Yes, I'm a woman. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think some people, you know, you can connect those dots if, 
if you want to, but I mm -hmm. would not connect those dots. I mean, I don't know. I would never say that it was a cause and effect situation. And then, you know, Nancy Pelosi fairly soon after this uh, showed cleavage in the House, too. Did you see that? Well, you know, I mean, as I said, I think what was important for me was not just the fact that there was cleavage on mm -hmm. display, but that it was Senator Clinton and it was in the Senate. I mean, would I have been as sort of surprised if it had been, you know, Nancy Pelosi? Probably not, mm -hmm. because, because yeah. she doesn't have that same kind of, you know, public ambivalence about her appearance and about style. Now, you end your column, I think, by criticizing Hillary that this is just one more example of Hillary trying to triangulate or fence straddle or whatever. She can't take a position. You know, if you're going to show cleavage, you either do it or don't do it. And so this was kind of a, mm -hmm. a symbolic of her more general flaws. Uh, no, I don't think it's symbolic of her more general flaws. I mean, I, again, I think that's, that's a leap, but I do think that it's sort of symbolic of the way that she's always kind of dealt with her public appearance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can take that as a matter of, of you know, the confidence in the way that you're presenting yourself, confidence in the way that people are perceiving you. Um, I mean, you can go that route, but to say mm -hmm. that it's a reflection of, you know, some sort of policy position, no. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I would never, I, I wouldn't go that far at all. Well, I looked at your last sentence for a long time, and I was, I thought that that was uh, implied. So, I mean, I guess people, people, maybe people see in a column what they already think. I mean, well, you, you know, got such a... You know, what's really funny is that one of the first columns that I ever wrote about uh, any political person happened to be about Hillary Clinton, and it was when she was still First Lady. Mm -hmm. And she had gone um, up to the Hill, actually, and I believe it was Whitewater Travelgate. I can't even remember at this stage. Uh -huh. But she was um, uh, dealing with the grand jury, and she wore this coat, which had a, a pattern on the back of it. And a lot of commentators were talking about how this coat had a dragon on the back, and they were making this leap to why would she wear that coat, and oh, you know, you know, the dragon lady coat, on and on and on it went. And I remember I called uh, her press office and asked about the coat, and they actually sent me a photo of the back of the coat. Mm -hmm. And the pattern was completely abstract. It didn't even... <laughs> I mean, it would, in no way, shape, or form was a dragon. And I wrote about how that wow. coat became like this very strange Rorschach test yep, exactly. for how Rorschach. people felt about yeah. her. Yeah. And, and so, you know, going all the way back to that, I do think, I mean, people have looked at her attire, the way she presents herself, and read a lot into it. I mean, she had a famous, I, mean, I don't know if you remember, you know, the pink press conference where she addressed the media and she was sitting there in this pink Oh, yes. The whole room suit. was her fashion and around her. There was a whole interior decoration aspect. Exactly. You know, she had the black headband on. She was wearing this pink suit. Yeah. Yeah. And there was this whole thing that, oh, well, she must be trying to soften her image because uh -huh. she's dressed in this very sweet right. pink. Well, but don't you think that there is symbolism in I mean, do you think it's just all accidental and people are projecting things, or do you think there really is a message in the way people look, in the way they present themselves with fashion or hair or makeup or all of those things? I no. mean, do you think that, that, that they're speaking in some way, that they're saying something that we should try to understand, or do you think that political commentators should just get over it and get past it? And, you know, it's interesting as a style point, but there's no political content. I, I tend to think that what happens is people sort of make a choice about what they're going to wear in the morning, and sometimes it's, you know, as basic as, oh, I've got a meeting, and so I want to make sure that, you know, I look professional, or I want to wear my favorite suit, my lucky suit, mm -hmm. or, you know, it's going to be an informal mm -hmm. event, so I don't really need to put on a tie, you know, if you're a man. But for me, what becomes interesting is how that kind of... Uh, those choices affect the way that the message is delivered, whatever that message is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, for me, that's really coming from, you know, the viewer, from the audience. It's not so much what 
was going through the mind of the person. Who's but I mean, if she's in, if she's there trying to get, send messages and influence us, and she knows that we're going to form subjective mm -hmm. opinions, then she's going to try to get a hold of that process and try to reach into our minds by you know whatever method she can, however effectively she can. Like if she wore an orange jacket at the debate, uh, she was mm -hmm. trying to project some kind of warmth or something. You know, I, I'm I'm a little cautious about sort of describing it that way because I tend to feel like. The only thing that you can really be sure of is, to, to some degree, is the way that someone is perceived. And mm -hmm. I kind of go back to that incident, you know, with the coat um, all those years ago and, and the yeah. grand jury. I mean, do I, do I think that she would have knowingly said, oh, let me wear this coat, which everyone's going to think, you know, has a dragon on the back as I go talk yeah. to the grand jury? But I do think that the way that people perceived that code said a lot about what they thought about her, yeah, what definitely. they thought about the yeah. situation. Yeah. I mean, that, and to me, that's what's really interesting. But don't you think she should be getting the jump on that? And, and somebody should be looking at, and at the point where she is with the stakes so high that somebody should be saying, uh, let's make mm -hmm. sure no one will look at that print and see a dragon or see some kind of an image. Right, I mean, like if I was doing an abstract painting, I wouldn't want someone to see a face in it, but people have a tendency to see yeah. a face. So I would think about whether a face could be perceived in it and maybe paint it a different way if, uh, if mm -hmm. I thought there was that danger, right? So isn't there, shouldn't she be getting control of the situation? Um, you know, I mean, I would certainly try to if I were in her, you know, if I were in her place. But when you kind of look back, it seems that whenever candidates have tried really consciously to control that, that they've yeah. gotten into a bit of trouble. I mean, most um, uh, famously, when Al Gore sort of, yeah. you know, went on the whole yeah, I was, earth, yeah. tone, uh, earth tone then, and, and that seemed to just, you know, say a lot of things about him, and they were all the wrong things. Well, do you think that he got into the problem because it got out into the news that he had taken the advice of Naomi Wolf and that she had some alpha dog theory that went with the earth tones and there was there was a, if only that the yeah. information that he was doing it on purpose and what his intention was if only that had been withheld from us he actually could have reached into our minds effectively and it actually would have been a good idea. Um, you know, maybe. I mean, that's that's a good point, and I wonder. I wonder too, uh, and this is sort of just, you know rhetorically, whether or not we would have responded the same way if it had been a woman who had consulted, you know, some image person and had, uh -huh. and had been told, oh, you know, you should wear more black and more navy and more gray because it yeah. makes you look more authoritative. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it would be taken a bit better if it, were, if it was a woman. I mean, I well, think with men, you know, it's, it's a really dicey situation. Yeah. We got so upset and, you know, crazed because John Edwards spent $400 yeah. on a haircut. Right, but we'd think nothing if a woman had a $400 makeup job or something. Right. We or would you expect know, like, her to do it. Like, you know, men who spend, spend the money getting someone to do their makeup before a television appearance, it's sort of like, okay, you're allowed to put some powder on your nose and that's <laughs> yeah. about it. Anything yeah. beyond that and you're getting really into, like, scary Primping, pampering. Yeah, you had a column category. about primping. What was it? Grooming. There's grooming and there's primping. Grooming and versus primping. <laughs> if he's not groomed, it's a disaster. But if we, if we, of course, this is subjective too. If we perceive it as crossing the line into primping, right? Then, of course, Edwards has a special problem in that there's that film out there of him fixing his hair. So right. once we see the behind the scenes part of it, where he actually is where primping, is then definitely we're more likely primping. to interpret other things as prim You know, it kind of resonates with what we already think of him. So if we already think he's a pretty boy. You know, and that there's something empty and right. vain about it. Right, it just validates him. that image yeah. that we already have. If it validates have. it. I mean, and similar to what you were writing, you were saying it's because of what we already know about Hillary Clinton that what she does mm -hmm. now has the meaning that it seems to have for us. You know, and that's a lot of some of the, or that was in a lot of the feedback that I got, actually, mm -hmm. where people weren't just talking about the column, but they were really reaching back and sort of, using all that they knew about her press coverage in the past mm -hmm. to explain why they were so upset about this one particular column and in many ways coming up with things that they were upset about 
that really had nothing to do with the column, but were based on things that had been said about her before. But they seem to have an idea that nobody should talk about how she looks anymore because she suffered so in the past or because women in general have suffered so in the past that it should just be off the table as something to talk about. I mean, in the way they were sort of impugning your whole uh, column niche. They, you know, they were. And, you know, my feeling is that <laughs> they're wrong, that I think cl the clothes matter, appearance matters. And, you know, my, I always say to people, look, if you were in the process of burying your mother and someone showed up at her funeral dressed in, you know, a bright red, low-cut dress <laughs> up to their, you know, rear end, you would be really offended because right. you would think, what the heck? You know, this person is not showing any respect. Where do they think they're going? And you could argue, well, you know what, the important thing is that they showed up. I, I, I thought that but you part can't of you, leave it at that. Yeah. I thought that part of what uh, was going on with Hillary Clinton was that she just has such a vigorous uh, campaign organization um, that you're just not allowed to criticize her about anything. So you were just pushed back really hard. And, uh, and there's something that bothers me about that, you know, mm -hmm. this idea that don't criticize Hillary Clinton or, or if you do, you're going to feel the full fury of the, of the Clinton campaign. Well, I did think that the campaign uh, fundraising letter was a bit disingenuous in that it, I thought, kind of went for, uh, you know, the easy money in a way by mm -hmm. appealing to just that very sort of visceral, oh, don't talk about a woman's clothes because that demeans her. Right. And it, it didn't, you know, and, and to describe the column as coarse or insulting, I just thought, like, where are you getting, what do you, what could you possibly find in that column that is coarse? There's nothing right. in the column right. that's coarse. Well, there was the stuff about the man's open fly and a woman's cleavage being like a man's open fly. Only in the sense that you, in, in seeing it on the senator, that you have that momentary sense of, oops, I wasn't supposed to see I'm that. I'm not supposed to look. But maybe in the workplace with women, uh, or in a lot of situations with women, people have mm -hmm. that idea that they're not supposed to look at her breasts. And even if she does things, I mean, the funny thing with, I mean, this whole thing of you wouldn't talk about a man like that, it's sort of like, but a man would never dress in any equivalent way. And it's mm -hmm. sort of like you have this part of a woman's body that people are very interested in, and that she feels free to highlight, maybe not yeah. by bearing part of it, but by boosting it up with a brassiere and so <laughs> forth. And yet, uh, it w it's deeply ingrained that you're not allowed to let it show that you're looking at it. Um, right, so there was that old uh, Seinfeld show, I think, where they had a whole discussion about how long you're allowed to look at a woman's <laughs> cleavage. You know, it's right. like staring into the sun. If you look too long, <laughs> you'll, you'll go blind. <laughs> you know, but I mean, it's, it's a funny, it's a really just, I find it very humorous, that it's a very funny part of human life that people are so interested in breasts. And I mean, what are they really that they're so, I mean, they're apparently so interesting to people, and yet uh, women don't feel they need to cover them up in, in a, an art culture at least, and, uh, and can, can even really very dramatically highlight them, and yet at the same, and, and they know mm -hmm. they're having a powerful effect on people, at least some people, uh, and, and yet those people are supposed to hide that they're having an effect. I mean, it's, it's actually rather, rather amusing. Well, I do think it's, it does kind of get to our discomfort with sex, basically, and anything that implies that someone is sexual or, mm -hmm. you know, and anything else. And... You know, and I would also argue that, you know, the Clinton campaign, they're very, um, they're hyper vigilant and hypersensitive. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say about the Clinton campaign. <laughs> well, do you, think you, do you think you were treated unfairly or do you want to defend yourself in any, oh, I mean, I, I guess I want to just raise the question that maybe the feminist response is right. And given the history of discrimination against women, maybe there really should be a powerful response if anyone tries to um, s sexualize mm -hmm. a female politician, that there's just so much old baggage uh, about uh, keeping women out of mm -hmm. non-traditional areas that if anybody, cro that we, we have to actively police this line, and, and, and you got out of line, so you need to be slapped back really hard. Mm -hmm. And then it's sort of like, go back to the style page, you shouldn't be writing about politics. I thought it was kind of a little bit ironic that they were saying, don't, uh, don't treat uh, Hillary like a traditional woman, and then they kind of treated you mm -hmm. like a traditional woman. 
Well, I mean, I, I did think that the, the idea that, oh, well, fashion can be a really lighthearted and fun thing to write about, but uh, as soon as you start talking about the way that it plays in a larger arena, well, then, you know, that's, that's off limits, or that, that doesn't make sense, or that's trivial, or something like that. To me, that says that, you know, people don't really have a real understanding of what the fashion industry is, and that it's, you know, it's, it's a lot more than just runways and celebrities. Yeah. But, but the other thing for me is that I really, you know, the idea of women achieving parity, I don't think that's ever going to happen until women feel like they can present them their full selves mm -hmm. in the workplace and in yeah. public. Right, and but they don't need to be imitations of men. They don't have to wear the pantsuit. And right, I mean, obviously we've come a very long way from the days of women feeling like they had to dress like a man in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. But there are still these areas of taboo, and there's still this sense that if a woman acknowledges that she might be interested in fashion or interested in her appearance yeah. or, you know, like to go shoe shopping, that every time she does that, her IQ is dropping, her prestige is dropping in the workplace. Yeah. And to me, that is very sort of a regressive way of thinking yeah. about things. The uh, Parody means that you're allowed to say that. I mean, a guy can stand right. around in the workplace and go on and on talking about baseball and box scores and right, his golf yes. game and, yeah. you know, the new fancy car that he bought and all kinds of other things that are deemed to be, you know, sort of masculine exactly. toys, yeah. and no one thinks less of him. Yeah, I think fashion is exactly equivalent to sports as a topic that has a gender-connected interest and that's on the same level of frivolity or significance. And, yeah, to, to uh, capsulize women and say they're being frivolous because they're interested in fashion, um, yeah, I think that's wrong, but I also think that, you know, that this image is really used to powerfully affect people's minds and mm -hmm. that to not be able to talk about, she's not just any woman, she's trying to be the most powerful person in the world, and we ought to be able to verbalize and defend against the ways in which she is manipulating our minds. So we need to become yeah. conscious of these things, we need to talk about them, you know, she's just not, she's not just any woman, she's trying to be very powerful, so we need to have a way to defend against them. I mean, there are obviously some great historical examples of figures who became powerful and used uh, their mm -hmm. physical image to um, control people, don't you think? Well, yeah, and I mean, and also the idea that, you know, you, you sort of can't really have it both ways in a way. I mean, part of what she's doing is using the fact that she's a woman. Right. In the campaign to her advantage. Right. I mean, whether it's something as simple as, you know, using the phrase, you go girl, mm -hmm. I mean, that is very much the sort of, um, you know, girls club battle right. cry. Right, right, right. And then to suddenly, you know, get incredibly defensive and aggressive when someone notes, makes note of, femininity and, you know, and accompanying things and mm -hmm. the accompanying, you know, parts of that, then it's sort of like, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, it's okay to talk about your gender in this area, but it's right. not okay to right. talk about right. it right. in yeah, this either other go, area. Yeah. Either go gender neutral or don't complain when yeah, people I mean, bring I, out the negative side of it. I mean, I say embrace it all. And, yeah. you know, one of the things that I mentioned is that, you know, when she ran for Senate, Clothes were off the table because she wore that black, you know, black pantsuits mm -hmm. practically 24-7. Yeah. So, obviously, she knows, they know that if you want to remove the topic of clothing and attire from the table, then, you know, do what the male candidates do. Wear a uniform. Wear yeah, the I mean, dark suit, the white shirt, right. you know? And that's People's what she did do. Yeah. And people will say, you know, well, you wouldn't talk about a man the same way, but it seems to me that men are completely in a box where they have to wear a suit. They have yeah. to completely sort of hide their sexuality. I mean, they're not forefronting their sexual parts uh, with push-up uh, articles of clothing <laughs> of any kind. And, uh, you know, basically to say, well, you're writing about a woman and you wouldn't write about the man the same way, there's just, I mean... What can you even say about men? Well, the I mean, funny thing the is that, suit? I mean, I have written about the men you uh -huh. know, in, in yeah. the past, so yeah. it's not as if I'm, you know, specifically focusing on on the woman and on her alone. 
but you know one of the great the great things is that men do have this uniform that they can put on that essentially is like camouflage for them and basically mm-hmm. they become like this free floating head just talking yeah. <laughs> yeah. you just don't really notice anything beyond yeah. that and women don't have that and in some ways that can be a problem in some ways it's a great freedom yeah. it's a great it's freedom and people should use it. to have yeah, I mean, it's great to have freedom. People should use it. Another thing about a man's suit is that it projects this image of power, and power for a man connects to sexuality more. So if a man is wearing a power suit, he's also expressing his sexuality. But if a woman right. wears a power suit, she's sort of hiding her feminine sexuality, so you don't get the, the connection of the two, the sexuality and the power and the sort yeah. of traditional professional suit. They don't all come together for a woman. So, I mean, what's a woman supposed to do? I mean, either she goes with the male look of power and then mm-hmm. she's hidden her sexuality or you know there's it's just, there's not just not a comparable thing for a man to you know, put up it, with you know it reminds me of this great quote from uh, Anne Hollander who's a uh-huh. fashion anthropologist yeah. fashion historian and yeah. I'm probably paraphrasing it but in a you know, she said that the, a suit, the suit is a triumph of civilization. Right. <laughs> she wrote a whole book on the suit, didn't she? Yeah, which yeah, I yeah. thought was, like, just a really fantastic fantastic quote because it is this article of clothing that makes every man who wears it, you know, traditionally, yeah. a traditional kind of suit, look like he has broad shoulders, right, a, a narrower waist, you know, that kind of V-shape, so Mm -hmm. he looks as sort of masculine and athletic as possible. It hides a multitude of sins. I mean, a custom-made suit is known for being able to make a man's physique look as sort of close to the ideal as possible. It immediately conveys power, authority. Yes. You know, and so, I mean, it's, it's this one item of clothing that... Like, everyone knows what it implies. Everyone Mm -hmm. knows what it means. The guy Mm -hmm. in the suit is the one that's in charge. I mean, we even refer to them, you know, as the suits. Is there some way we can get men to uh, wear suits more often? Because I'm I'm out here in Madison, Wisconsin, and all the men are in play clothes. I mean, they're all wearing shorts. They break out the shorts when it's like 40 degrees here. I mean, they look like giant little boys. You know, they're in their little T-shirts and their shorts, and and they're, and it's, it's, it's very troublesome to me here. Why don't they? Uh, nobody wears I never a suit. understand why <laughs> men don't seem to understand that they always look great in a suit. Yes, yes. And they always look like boys in shorts. I know, but I sort of suspect that it has something to do with the whole baby boomer situation and yeah. the Peter Pan complex. Yeah. And they still have it in their head that, oh, well, you know, it was my father who wore the suit. And as long as I don't put on a suit, well, then I'm still... I'm still young. clinging to my youth. Yeah, but they look like an over. <laughs> at some point, they're so sort of tubby that they actually look like a giant baby. Well, you know, <laughs> as I said, like the suit, it hides it hides a multitude of sins. That's right. I'm still waiting for the women's industry to come up with something comparable. Yeah, I know. I've been looking for that for decades. Aside from seems- you know a moo moo. <laughs> <laughs> now I was. Oh, I want to ask you about uh, Jerry Thompson. The Fred Thompson's yeah. wife, yeah, yeah. and uh, she's been wearing sort of really flaunting as sort of the feminine attributes, and people are almost. De- I, I mean, I would say she is actually kind of running his campaign and really pushing him forward, and is actually yeah. a very powerful woman. And she is using those clothes, I think, to kind of fly under the radar, or sort of, uh, you know, sort of using mm-hmm. the slang term for breasts uh, dazzled by the headlights, you know. Right. Um, uh, that she seems to be deliberate. Oh, of course, she's very beautiful, so mm-hmm. why not look good? But I think it's also a way of kind of uh, minimizing that you really are the kind of the brains in the outfit. Sort of trying to uh, camouflage the amount of clout you actually have, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. You know, I do think it's it's interesting the way that people have responded to her, in you know, in part because of just sort of naturally how she looks, but also because of the kind of clothes that she wears. Yeah. And, you know, I sort of use it, like, exhibit A. If you don't think clothes say something about the way people are going to respond to you, I mean, I mean that's a pretty obvious example. Mm-hmm. But, but as you said, it's, it's very interesting because she is obviously very smart and very savvy and I think has been really quite brilliant in the way that she's yeah. used the clothes. 
Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, the whole idea of her as, you know, trophy wife, well, one, I think, you know, if you can be a trophy wife when you're in your 40s, I say, you know, good for you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Or, I mean, it's a, it's a way of actually exercising. I mean, it's a traditional way of exercising power. So from a feminist perspective, it might not be good mm-hmm. to say, oh, isn't that great that she figured out how to exercise power without looking like she's exercising power. Well, but I think that sort of raises the bigger question of, well, okay, what is a powerful woman supposed to look like? You know, yeah. why can't she look like Jerry Thompson? Yeah, yeah I think and, that's a great you know, point. Yeah. You know, why why yeah. does she, what what does that really mean? Right. You know, she doesn't look like a powerful woman. I mean, I think in, in many ways it's very, it's wonderful that yeah. she's been able to sort of wear these clothes that a lot of people say, oh, that's like very Hollywood or something yeah. like that, and still be considered, you know, the brains behind the operation. Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in a way, I think she's she's helping women because she's being openly uh, feminine or openly showing her feminine body and not trying to cover it up. Uh, uh, but, it, you know, might have worked through with the whole lower the IQ idea that you said before. It might be that she was doing that mm-hmm. on purpose because it would actually have frightened people if she seemed uh, too much what she really is so that mm-hmm. it's a way of being disarmed. I mean, disarming other people is a way of exercising power. But I do have a little bit of a conflict over saying that because, you know, that's sort of like traditionally people would say, well, the woman behind the man, she's really the strong one. That's how mm-hmm. women exercise power. It's sort of like not really what well, we I want. Well, I don't know that I would describe her attire, though, as particularly disarming. I mean, I think that it's intimidating in a, in a yeah. very different kind of way. Yeah. I mean, I see, I recall having a conversation with, um, you know, someone who was working for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Uh and one of the things that she said was that, and as part of her job, she had to deal with a lot of the donors, a lot of the the trustees, who were women, and she would go to these meetings, and she said she would walk in, and these these women would be dressed impeccably. Mm -hmm. They would be incredibly fashionable. To the point where she said it was almost intimidating mm-hmm. that she really felt like she had to kind of up her game in order to deal with them on an equal level. Uh-huh. And I think there is something intimidating when an incre- you know, a woman walks into a room who is incredibly well-dressed, and by that I mean sort of fashionably dressed, and is really confident in that. Mm-hmm. Because I, it yeah. does, it you know, it takes a certain amount of strength and assuredness to be able to do it. Well, do you think part of it is just that it's a display of wealth? Um, I think to some degree it can be a display of wealth. But I think for a lot of people, they're not necessarily going to recognize the clothes as expensive. They're just uh-huh. going to recognize them as especially chic. But there, I mean, there's this whole thing that there's an area of knowledge. It's like flaunting your expertise in something. I mean, there's an mm-hmm. area of knowledge, fashion, which uh, most people, women who work, just can't keep up with all the details there. And if somebody else, I mean, part of it is you can't afford to just go to the most expensive place and buy all the stuff that they're telling you is in mm-hmm. fashion. So you, it's like an arcane knowledge that you don't quite have. I mean, it's partly money, it's partly knowledge. But if someone else really has it, uh, you can mm-hmm. feel intimidated by that. I think you can. I think a lot of times, you know, what really intimidates people is not so much the the labels that are in someone's clothes or that ability to be able to recognize something as really pricey. It's the fact that they have style, that they are able to express their personality so eloquently Mm -hmm. by through their appearance. And I think we recognize that. And 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 you're right. I mean, I think a lot of women and, and men, for that matter sort of struggle with it because they do see how sort of potent that can be. And it's almost like a language that they just don't understand. You know, they yeah. have a few bits of vocabulary, but they don't know how to string it together into uh-huh. a cohesive sentence. Yeah. I want to ask you about Michelle Obama. Uh, she, there was an article about her the other day about uh, how she wasn't wearing, people were saying she wasn't wearing much makeup, and she actually, like Hillary in the old days, was wearing a headband. And, uh, you know, she was mm-hmm. basically saying she, this is a quote from her, I want people to get used to my face more naturally so they don't have to put it on every day. Who's got time to put eyelashes <laughs> on and all of that? So, I mean, this is sort of the standard uh, feminist uh, idea that I'm a busy woman uh, mm-hmm. and also the, the natural look, which, uh, 
goes back a ways. But uh, what do you think of uh, what do you think of her? I mean, I think she looks great. So I was surprised that people were saying yeah. she wasn't doing enough because she. I thought she looked great. But uh, what do you think of uh, her take on how to present herself? Yeah, I, I do. I think she looks. I do think she looks great. I think that it's a really tricky position for that that whole sort of first lady position because mm -hmm. it's so much about just symbolism. Yeah. Beyond anything else. And as a symbolism, as symbolism, appearance, you know, it matters a thousand times more than it would if it was an actual job with very specific responsibilities. You know, you could then have this very easy way of judging whether or not someone is doing it well or doing mm -hmm. it poorly. Yeah. But I think when it's purely symbolic, you know, the, the main thing that people are judging you on is, well, you know, how, how did she look at the ribbon cutting? Yeah. And it's, it's sort of ridiculous. And I think, it, you know, it's clearly a position that, that needs to be redefined. So I think yeah. it'll be interesting. I think I like that sort of idea of get used to me looking, you know, very natural yeah. so that this is the face that you're accustomed to seeing, and you're not accustomed to seeing this very sort of dolled up, made up face. Yeah. Although if you're if you look really great, unmade up, you can you can pull it off. Right. Well, it's right. the old fashioned you know beauty thing of oh well the new look is the natural look, right. which essentially is a fully made up look that is meant to look natural. <laughs> right. 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 But well, you know, or it's a, a look that, uh, you know, if you're naturally beautiful, uh, you, you, you can act superior that you're not even making yourself up, but you look great anyway. And then other people who will mm -hmm. only look good with their makeup on, they can't keep up with the style or they look like they're being overly fussy, but really they're just trying to make up for a disadvantage. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because in covering uh, uh, Hillary Clinton and Laura Bush as first ladies, the one thing that I've noticed is that they all... They always seem to get a firmer grasp on their public appearance in the second term. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, now I'm going to quote, you know, Anna Winter from Vogue, mm -hmm. who, you know, basically once said, if you're staring at your photograph on the, you know, the front of the Washington Post every day, mm -hmm. after a while, you're, you're going to want to make sure that all those photos that are getting, you know, filed away in history are good photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe, yes, you know, yes. who 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 isn't at yeah. least a little bit vain in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I was just uh, just before uh, Lady Bird Johnson died, I was down in Austin and I went to the uh, Johnson Library, mm -hmm. uh the LBJ Library and uh, there was a whole section of it on her and uh it was kind of interesting to to see her clothes and she I think you wrote one of your columns about her recently uh you know that she had to follow yeah. after Jackie Kennedy who obviously hit the ground right. running. Right. Right, exactly. I mean it was it was interesting to read, um, you know, the I quoted from the Women's Wear Daily obituary for Mrs. Johnson, and when they talked about her style, I mean, it was really sort of sad. I mean, they talked about, oh, well, you know, she finally managed to slim down to a size 12 or something, but still her really? pantyhose sagged at her ankles. And wow, I, I, thought, heard oh, I saw her God. dresses. I saw her dresses in person. They were so small. Every well, time you know, I go to back then, a twelve was actually an eight. So. <laughs> it was tiny. Uh, yeah. Wow. And, so what you know, you know, and it was kind of, it was so mean because I thought, well, you know, you're comparing her to a woman who essentially, you know, was this incredible fashion icon. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I I really thought that one of the things that she did was really expand the way that we thought about beauty and right. the importance of beauty in, in yeah. our lives. Yeah. And and that certainly extends to not just, you know, her beautification projects with mm -hmm. nature, but also to the fashion industry as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think it's important to, um, and this goes back to sort of an overall theme here, I, I think it's important to recognize that the visual world is an important part of life and that beauty is actually profound and important. Yeah, I mean, I think beauty is not only important, but I think it, it I mean, it, it's important and it serves a very specific purpose, which I think is to certainly make us feel better about, you know, the world around us, but it also, I think, is another form of communication. It's another kind of expression, mm -hmm. and it adds nuance to, you know, what we say verbally, and, and I, and it, and you know, it can be just a sign of respect and good mm -hmm. manners and an and understanding of, 
you know, the, sort of the solemnity of an event, the importance mm -hmm. of an event, all those kinds of things come into play. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you about uh, Crocs, speaking of the formality <laughs> and, the, uh, and beauty and all of that. Honestly, Anne, anything in the name of comfort seems to be <laughs> <laughs> the case. And you know what? And I cannot tell you how many emails I got from people in defense of Crocs. What are they saying? I don't even understand them. Why would people want to wear... I can understand Dansko clogs. I think Dansko... Do you approve of Dansko clogs? <laughs> well, you know, I'm a fan of the clog. I think it's a perfectly acceptable shoe. It can be very good for the... I mean, I love Dansko clogs. They're, they're great standing shoes. Like, if you teach and you're standing mm -hmm. for an hour or two, they really feel good. But uh, there's well, a whole, you know, the but they're not as in-your-face cloggy as the Crocs. Well, the Cro thing crocs. with the Crocs is that, you know... I mean, I think they're for their original purpose, which was, you know, on boats, if you're wearing them in the garden, if you're on your yeah. feet all day and you find them really comfortable, I say more power to you. But it, there, it has got, it really has gotten to the point where, oh my gosh, it's, they're comfortable. They're so comfortable. Therefore, they're absolutely perfectly fine to wear under all circumstances. <laughs> and you just want to go, you know what, I'm sure your pajamas are comfortable too, but are you going to wear those <laughs> to the office? Well, I mean, they're, they're also, they don't, why do they need to be a bright color? That has nothing to do with comfort. They're just why, like, they're like, they're like cartoon shoes. Why like grown People want to have Mickey Mouse oh. feet, like giant, yeah, you know, exactly. I think. <laughs> why grown-ups want to wear, like, bright orange shoes with, you know, flowers stuck on them? I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, I really, I mean, it's similar to the, the whole shorts issue with me. This idea that uh, people think that they're becoming children again with their, with their clothes. Well, and, they wanna, and they want to be, I mean, this is the opposite of wanting your sexuality to be perceived. You want to sort of desexualize yourself and turn yourself into a child. Well, I think it's a little bit of just, you know, the, we live in a very narcissistic kind of culture, I think. And the, the number one priority is, well, I'm comfortable, mm -hmm. so that's yeah. all that matters. Yeah, every time I bring up the subject of shorts on my blog, and the, you know, as if it's like my special thing, I don't want men wearing shorts... I get all these comments that are all about <laughs> comfort. You know, I'm comfortable. And, uh, well, that's sort of a male thing is that it's like, uh, you know, think what you will. I'm not going to budge one inch because, uh, because of what right. something looks like. I just do exactly what I feel, you know. And that's sort of a manly thing to do. <laughs> well, it's a, you know, it's a manly thing to profess not to really care about yeah. style. But we know that's not true. They must care. <laughs> oh, well, speaking of caring and the symbolism of clothes, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, the judge with his uh, with his pants, the famous pant uh, the pant suit, the pant lawsuit. Um, what was his oh. name? Pearson. Ro was it Roy Pearson? I think yeah. Oh, judge Roy. That. Judge, as a, he was actually a judge, so he should know better than, than to bring uh, frivolous lawsuits. Yes. But, well, but I, did. I bow to my colleague, Mark Fisher, who was spectacular in covering that case. It was... Oh, yeah. Wait, I mean, I had literally the... every, every new development was mind-boggling. Uh, yeah, I'm actually looking at his article. I had it up on the computer. I was just searching through. He wrote a he wrote an excellent piece on that. Uh, how about that? It was to the point when the when he talked about how they gave him a pair of pants back. You know, they they lost his pants. The dry cleaners lost his pants, and then they handed over the pants. Uh, and, he, and I'm reading from Mark Fisher's article. He yeah. said, these are not my pants, he's saying at the trial. I have in my adult life, with one exception, <laughs> never worn pants with cuffs. And she said, these are your pants. Uh, Pearson paused. He struggled to breathe deeply. This is where he breaks down and cries, that they could <sighs> think that he would wear pants with cuffs. <laughs> Shocking. Shocking. The fact that the man would cry over pants. Well, I mean, there's a, just the theory that he's of crazy. Of all the but things to cry over, pants would be at the very bottom of my list. But I mean, I think. But I, I was writing on my book. I, I actually think pants really do have a lot of meaning for a person. In that, uh, it's when you put on your pants that you realize, w w you know, whether you're gaining weight, and he was, or you know, or, or whether you're in shape. It's your pants that are really giving you the strongest feedback about all the about things you might waistline. be in denial about. And he brought those pants in to get them altered. He needed them let out because he had gained weight. So it, I, I sort of thought like, it was like as if it, he was trusting them with his uh, intimate <laughs> secret. 
And they didn't, you know, he, it was like the dry cleaner uh, customer uh, relationship, and he didn't honor it. And they didn't honor it. They didn't respect the sort of intimacy yeah. of handling his pants and his intimate problem of, of having gained weight and needing the pants let out. And for I them to just buy give all him. I that, but <laughs> not $60 million. <laughs> Well, but that, that was, you know, it's sort of like they didn't just lose his pants. They, they, they broke this, uh, this trust. They, uh, they, they lost his manhood. They Alan. broke his heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kept thinking that pants were, of all of the pieces of your wardrobe, that's like where you express the least amount of personality. You know, it's not a tie where that's supposed to be all about personality and being able to be a little quirky. It's not the suit jacket, which is what people sort of notice when they compliment you on your suit. So they're you really the looking at just... sort of the fit of the of the jacket. It's like the pants just sort of seemed like utilitarian. Well, um, yeah. So, so the pants are just sort of like they covering up the part of the body that obviously has to be closed, but clothed. But you're not exactly. really saying anything with your pants. <laughs> which a lot of a lot of emailers are, you know, so asking me. So, what I'm going to write about? the men and their pants and how tight they may or may not be and what they may or may not reveal. <laughs> well, you know, uh, right, I know. Well, um, right, you know, uh, part of that is that uh, there's no equivalent thing to cleavage with pants. Uh, you remember the uh, Eldridge Cleaver pants? Or, the, well, I think, we were, no. did we talk about that? Did we talk about that in this clip or did we talk about that at another point? But you know the Eldridge Cleaver pants that actually, you know what I'm talking about? No, I, what are the Eldridge Cleaver pants? Eldridge Cleaver, design, of all things, designed some pants that actually contained a, excuse the expression, but a penis sheath that would actually put the male genitalia in a sort of a, a displayed uh, area, the way a bra like would... Like a cod piece? Like a cod piece, yeah. That would be different. And I promise you, if any of the candidates turn up <laughs> in a they cod piece... You will write about that. <laughs> I'm all over that. <laughs> With no apologies, I'm all over that. Yeah, well, um, you know, that would be one way to stand out in the crowd. You know, the men all look alike. When they're on the stage, it's sort of like, well, who are all these guys? All these, uh, well, they all look alike. <laughs> well, I also joke that if anyone showed up looking like they were an extra from Boogie Nights, I would be sure to write about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. They're all, uh, you know, they're in this, uh, they're in this, th they're in, in this uniform hiding from us. But uh, all, any of the things that they could do that would break out would, would be bad. I mean, like, I noticed in one of the debates a couple of weeks ago, Dennis uh, right. Kucinich was wearing a, a checked shirt. And even that just seemed like, you know. Oh, I remember that shirt. I kind of liked that shirt. I thought but that, that was, was quite But that was a very daring. unusual thing to do. It's sort of, can this man be daring. president? He's wearing a checked shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to when they do their debates, you know, for MTV or something like that, because that's when the clothes always get a little interesting. Oh, yeah. Or when because, they talk about their underpants. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because <laughs> then they're always trying to figure out, oh, well, you know, I really shouldn't wear the suit and tie that's a little too formal for this mm -hmm. audience. I have to be, you know, cool like the kids. Yeah, yeah. And then that's when sartorial disasters happen. Yeah. Well, we should... Uh we should keep track of all those little details. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been great talking to you. It's do you want to bring up any more subjects, or should we <laughs> sign off? What do you think? Um, I think um, I think we're done. Okay, <laughs> I think we have covered it. <laughs> we, we talked about the shoe. We didn't talk about hats. Anything about going hats? On that? Well, there was a, a, um, a, the other day. President Bush was meeting with um, Hamid Karzai. And there was a nice picture of, of the two of them together. And Karzai was wearing that hat that really didn't look like a summer hat to me. Oh, is this the 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 Karakul? I'm pronouncing that wrong. I'm sure. Uh, hat that it's like a it's not Persian lamb. It's um, it's it's the hat that he always wears. Yes, he always wears yeah, that yeah. hat. It's a yeah yeah. He always looks great, actually. Hamid, Hamid Karzai. Well, I, I do a, believe it was Tom Ford who said that he was the most. Uh, fashionable man alive or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> But he's not I think he was being facetious, though. But he, <laughs> <laughs> well, but so, so that's the hats. We haven't, we've talked about the hats, the shoes, the pants, the jackets, the <laughs> cleavage. I think we've covered it all. We've called, covered the entire <laughs> wardrobe. Okay, <laughs> so, should we say goodbye? All right. Okay. It's been fun, Anne. It was great talking to you. Thank you.